It's a statistically proven fact that most men grow out of putting their friends in headlocks by age seven. Stefan Kesting, well, he's just taking a little bit longer. Hi, I'm Stefan Kesting, and we've got an awesome show for you today on Grapple Arts Radio. It's an interview with David Meyer, and it's so extensive that I have no problem calling it everything you ever wanted to know about BJJ competition, but were afraid to ask. Just before we get started, though, I want to point out that I always appreciate it when people help spread the word and tell other people about this podcast episode. So if you know somebody who would be helped by this information or would find it interesting, please take the time to fire them a quick email with a link to the blog post or the name of the show so they can find it in iTunes. Also, if you haven't already done so, go to beginningbjj.com and sign up for your free e-course about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Every day, people get in touch with me to tell me how much this material has improved their grappling. And I wouldn't want you to be the only grappler on the planet who isn't taking advantage of that information. Today's guest, David Meyer, comes from a strong background in several traditional Japanese Jiu-Jitsu systems, and he started training under the Machado brothers way back in the early 1990s. And because of that, became one of the very first Americans to get the rank of black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He was also one of the first American black belts ever to medal in the Mundial in the World Championships back in 1998. And he's competed all over the place in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and submission grappling. Why he's here today is that he's helped create a number of instructional products, one of the most recent being the book Training for Competition, which was published by Black Belt Books. And it's that topic, competing in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and submission grappling, that's also the topic of today's interview. So I want to start with a softball question, David. Why on earth should we compete? Why go through all that stress and the anxiety and then sitting around all day and spending the money and then having a relatively brief period of panic on the mat? Uh, does it actually have <laughs> any carry over to your development as a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner? Well, um First of all, thanks for having me. Um, uh, competition is not for everyone. So for people that are really just doing training uh, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or grappling or whatever their sport is, if they're really just doing it for casual fun and they don't want to subject themselves to extra stress and they're not particularly concerned about getting better one way or another, they're just having fun, or maybe they just really you know, feel a lot of stress when they're out under pressure and in front of friends, competition may not be for them. However... The benefit of competition is that, well, actually, there's a number of benefits. Uh, the, the first benefit, I'd say, the prime benefit of competition is normally viewed as you get a chance to go out there and test your skills against people that you don't normally train with. So those would be people who may be executing techniques that you are not familiar with, or they may be executing techniques you're not familiar with, but you still don't know what to expect with them because... As you know, when, when you know most people train in their school and don't do a lot of cross training in other schools, and so what tends to happen is you become acquainted with the various people on the mat, and you sort of know that this is the guy with the good triangle and this is the guy with the really good sweep, and and that's great, and you get to learn to defend against that. But what you'll find is you tend to repeat the same pattern. So your matches with certain people tend to be the same match every night because they know your game, you know their game, and. It, you can reach a point at which you're not really being pressed to expand unless you are intentionally doing that or your instructor is doing it. For example, saying, you know what, you've got a really good triangle. I don't want to see you do a triangle for the whole next month. I want to, you know, or you're, you're always on the mount. I want to see you start every fight underneath the mount at, on every match for the next month, forcing yourself sort of out of your comfort zone. But what the competition tends to do is you're immediately out of your comfort zone because you just don't know who the other person is and what they're going to throw at you. And then when you add to that the pressure and adrenaline, um, it tends to be for, make for a learning experience. So it's a great way to, on the one hand, test your skill. And that's, that's why most people think of that, because they want to win. Um, but from my point of view, the real winning in the competition is just getting out there and, and trying to do your best against an unknown opponent. Ironically, if you lose, that's your best chance at learning. I mean, if everything goes the way you think and you get to pull off your favorite move and you tap the guy out and you tap all your opponents out and you win, that's extremely gratifying. But the truth is you don't tend to learn very much from that. 
uh, you have to be disciplined to then go back and say, well, yeah, I won, but why didn't I win faster? Or, yeah, I ended up getting the guy in an armbar on the third try, but why didn't I get it on the second or first try? Most people don't do that. They just go home and gloat. But if you lose, it becomes a great opportunity to say, wow, what did that guy do to me? And, and that was something I've never seen before, or why did that work? And, and those, in my experience, become the most powerful learning experiences, and you really learn those moves, and, and that will never happen to you again. So I, I think that's the main reason I would say people should, should go to compete is because it's a chance to learn and put themselves into unfamiliar environments so they can expose weaknesses in their game that may not otherwise be exposed. But I would add to that, it's also a great way to focus your training because when, when we're just training night after night after night, there's no particular goal. I mean, you're trying to stay healthy, you do your warm-ups. But when you have a competition coming up, let's just say in three or four weeks, it starts to make you pay more attention to what you're eating. It starts to make you, you know, paying a little bit of attention to getting better sleep. And you ramp up to it and you try to put in that extra effort. And it's a great way to help you focus your training and having that come up every couple months is just a, a great way to really push you to excel as opposed to just having one night become the same as the next night. So that would, those would be my top line. To tie. Well, and actually there's one more I would toss in there. From a self-defense point of view... This is exactly you know, what my next question was going to be, the, uh, the, adrenal, the adrenal freak-out factor. So. Exactly, exactly. Well, and you know, uh, it's interesting, Stephen, because... Um, we are martial artists, and as such, we consider ourselves to be fighters. I think most people who who do Brazilian jiu-jitsu and submission grappling, they, you know, they're sports. We're not pulling out knives. We're on soft environments with soft mats. We're guaranteed one opponent, not multiple opponents. I mean, there's a million reasons why it's a fighting art, but obviously it's a sport. But I think fundamentally we all like to believe, and I do believe it's true, that fundamentally there's a self-defense, self-preservation aspect to the martial art that we're doing is any practice of the martial arts. And the, one of the really big missing factors in most people's training is adrenaline and fear. And so I think anyone who's had a life-threatening situation on, on the street will tell you that it really wasn't so much about knowing the right move or, or anything like that. It was more just about the, the fear you felt and the panic and the shortness of breath and, and the indecisiveness of, wow, is this coming down? Is this a fight? Is it not a fight? Should I run? Should I stand? You know, all those kinds of things. So I, I think that people, for that reason alone, should jump at the opportunity to put themselves in stressful situations. Now, obviously, when you're on a competition mat, it's not the same kind of fear that you fear when someone is approaching you on the street and you think they might be armed or, or, or whatever that situation is. But it's better than just your normal training with your buddies on your mat in your, on your home mat. It, it really is. that there, there is an element of fear because you, you do fear injury because you don't know the other guy's control and, and you're both going really hard, harder than normal. And then, of course, because people are watching and, and everybody has their ego involved to some extent, you really want to do well. And it puts in this whole level of pressure, which interestingly can cause you to really perform very differently. Mm-hmm. And there are people, there are people who, who don't do that well in their home school and they just you know, just excel um, in competition. And more commonly, there's people who do very well in their normal grappling and really perform very poorly in competition. And so I think it's a great chance to put yourself under pressure and learn how to deal with that adrenal dump and learn how to breathe through it. And I, I do believe that if you get very seasoned at that, then if you do find yourself in a stressful situation on the street, you're more likely to be able to say, listen, just take a deep breath. Don't don't get tunnel vision. Don't lose all perspective. Don't go berserk here. Keep your wits about you because those are exactly the skills you need when you're competing. Well, from, from personal experience, I have to agree with you. I mean, I'm a very nervous competitor. And there was a couple years back there when I was doing a lot of competition, both in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and submission grappling and in the Firefighter Combat Challenge. And by competing every couple of weeks to, to every month or so, by the end of that year, it was kind of another day at the office sort of thing. Yes, you were excited, but, but you can actually master that, that adrenaline dump. But let's jump a little bit back to, you were, you're talking about the phenomenon of a gym fighter, a guy who, who kicks ass at the, at the dojo on the mat, and then he, he gets out to the tournament and he, he completely falls apart. And we've all seen this, and you said it's pretty common, and I, I agree that most people perform under their level. What do you think is going on specifically in most cases there, and, and what can they do to 
to make sure that their performance at their tournament is at least up to their, their normal performance standards, if not better? Well, I think there are two things that are going on. Well, I mean, one thing is, as I mentioned, people tend to learn, you know, learn the games, the other people they compete with in their class. So sometimes someone who's really good is just really figured out everybody else, and they're able to sort of they got, kind of have their number, and they've determined their weaknesses, and that allows them to do very well in the gym, and then they don't have that benefit when they step out onto the mat with somebody else. But, but frequently when we think of the really good gym fighters, those guys can also do well when someone else, you know, new steps onto the mat on their home mat. And so that's more a case, I think, of they're just relaxed, and, and they have good skills, and, you know, like anything in life, if you're tense, you're not going to, you, you, you can't you know, you're, you're, you become sort of overly focused and you can't go with the flow and you can't adapt. You need to be fluid and you need to be relaxed to adapt um, and to be able to move and to be able to see what another person is doing and adjust to it. Um, so I think that when someone is relaxed, and often these gym fighters are very confident and they're very relaxed in that mat, then when they go out into the competition, you know, because their ego gets involved and they really want to do well, they're not able to fight in a relaxed manner, and, and suddenly they're, they're over-trying, and they're becoming, you know, everybody becomes more cautious, you know, you're not going to take as many chances, so you're really kind of tightening up your game, and when you grip, you're going to be gripping extra tight, um, because you really don't want to let the person get away, or you're going to try your sweep extra hard, and, and maybe hunker down more than you would, and so it just causes people to fight not in the relaxed manner that they normally fight, and I think that's what happens, so my recommendation to people who do that is the you know, experience cures that. It's just to get out there on the mat. I tell people, go out and lose a few matches because really there's no, there's no way to become more relaxed about fighting and kind of care a little bit less than to lose once or twice, realize that, hey, my friends still love me, my mom still loves me, you know, I'm still a rising. fighter. Yeah, and, and get rid of that. And, and, and when you don't fear losing, then you're able to play more normally because you're not, you're not operating with this, with this abnormal fear of, gosh, I really don't want to lose. Um, and I think that's the cure for it is just get rid of that fear of losing, lose once or twice, don't care about it, and then relax. And once those fighters relax again, then they get back to their normal state of being able to adapt and, and read, what's, you know, read what's going on. Do you think it's possible to be too relaxed sometimes? I, or perhaps relax is the wrong word and maybe... Uh, there's optimal levels of arousal for every activity. I mean, for, for powerlifting, you should probably be a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. You should probably be in a, almost a complete rage. Whereas if you're throwing darts, if you're that aroused, um, that emotionally engaged, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to come anywhere near the dartboard. So obviously I'm guessing you would think that jiu-jitsu would be in the middle there somewhere. So is it possible to be under-aroused or, or yes. relaxed? Yes, and that's been... Yeah, that's interesting, and, and you're, very, you're very perceptive to even raise that question because most people don't, but it actually I think it is. There are some people who are, so, in, a, in a competition, one of the, one of the you know, we've, we've talked about some of the differences between the competition and, the, and your regular training on the mat, and we've said, well, one of the big differences is you're fighting someone that you may not be familiar with unless you've competed against them before, so there's that, uh, you know, that level of, of um, not knowing the person, then there's also the stress. But another big difference in competition is there's a time limit and there are points. And generally when people are training on the mat, in their home mat, unless they're specifically training for competition, so they're sort of doing practice matches, generally they're not overly focused on the points. They tend to be fighting more toward, for, for the finish. Um, and they're not particularly watching the clock. I mean, you know, when, when your few minutes ends and your instructor says, okay, time to switch, you just switch. You're not, you weren't trying to get something accomplished within, those, within that time frame. So um, what ends up happening is if you come too relaxed to a match and you're, like, really committed to not getting out of breath and, and not, you know, have burning your grips and you're being so relaxed, what can happen is the other person might be very conscious of, the, you know, let's just say it's an eight-minute or maybe it's the blue belt, your five-minute time limit, and they are exploding because they know, look, they've got five minutes to get the job done. And if, if you get too passive, you might get yourself into a situation where you're in a defensive mode, and now when you try to turn it on in the last minute of the fight, you can't recoup those points or you can't recoup that position because the other person is just, just too aggressive and has overwhelmed you. So I think 
it, part of the experience of competition and the savvy that you get as you get some experience is learning to balance not being inappropriately excited so that you don't burn your grip out and you're not, you're not you know, kind of tightening up your moves so that you can't flow, but at the same time, being able to hold intensity and explosion when it's needed so you don't just sort of get bowled over in the first minute or two and then uh, have to play catch-up on points or something like that and ultimately lose because you were just trying to be too relaxed. There is a school of thought, and I do ascribe to this, that if you lose a match, you, sh- you should not be able to stand up. You should be so tired that you've expended every bit of energy. Because most, most tournaments are single elimination, so that if you lose once, you're out. And unless you've also you know, entered into a different division, let's just say the absolute or the open weight class division, as soon as you lose, you, you've, you don't get a second chance. So you want to be sure that if you lose, that you, didn't, you left it all on the mat, is what they say. And so someone who's too relaxed, might, you, you would know that if you lost the match and you walked off and you realized, you know, I've got a lot of energy left and I just lost. Why didn't I extend that energy? Well, that's the uh, that's the tip of the day right there. That's uh, um, I think that's going to be really valuable for people. Can we jump back another step for 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 somebody who's never been to a tournament? Obviously, the best thing for them to do is to go and watch it or or go and participate. But some people like to know what they're in for in advance. Can you take us through sort of a typical day at a typical Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournament? The weigh-in, the rules meeting. Um, whether it's single elimination or not, which it obviously is, uh, and um, sort of the flow of the day, the timing, how long can you expect to be there? Yeah, I mean, there's, there is some variation because there is some rule disparity sometimes between tournaments and, and, um, and the way they're run. And obviously more, you know, some tournaments are much better organized than others. I, I would dare to say that, yeah, kind of a hallmark of at least Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournaments is they tend to not be very well organized and therefore there's a lot of waiting around and sometimes they start late. So, uh, you know, you've got to take everything and say with a grain of salt, but it, for it the is, general... It is Brazilian jiu-jitsu, not Swiss jiu-jitsu. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's funny how the Americans seem to make the same... You know, I, I actually, I, there are some very well-run tournaments out there now and, and some of them are run by Brazilians, um, some of the international... Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation staff is, is run actually very professionally, very well, and, and some of them are run by Americans. But there, there's a wide variety of professionalism when it comes to both the tournament organizing and, unfortunately, in the, the, the actual um, judging sometimes. But setting that aside, the basic, what, what generally happens is um, so, so some tournaments have the weigh-ins the day before, and increasingly, you know, so they, you know, you can go like on, on a Friday, maybe the tournament's on a Saturday and a Sunday. You go in and, and you have all day where you can sort of show up to the gym or to some local school um, in the same city where the tournament's happening and do your weigh-in the day before. Uh, they're, of course, trying to make sure that you're not over the allotted weight. What's increasingly happening, especially in the international tournaments, is that the weigh-in occurs right when your division is called and you weigh in wearing your uniform. So, what, which I think is a, a much fairer way to do it. So that way, you know, it you prevents know, excessive kind of, weight cutting. Exactly, exactly. Because so, for your listeners who may not know it, I mean, you can cut weight by obviously starving yourself, but usually cutting weight is, is also just a, a, an excessive loss of of um, liquids. People will, you know, cover themselves in plastic and exercise and sweat out. You know, you can sweat out, depending on your size, a good 10 or 15 pounds if you really had to in a couple of days before the tournament. And then, of course, you're in a weakened state because you're dehydrated and you need a day or two to rehydrate. And it sort of allows people to kind of cheat on the weight thing. So when you don't allow people that re- chance of rehydration, it sort of discourages that weight cutting. And, and it just means that when, if the weight cutoff is, you know, whatever the weight cutoff is, then it really means something because when two guys step on the mat, they were just weighed minutes before. So increasingly, the weigh-in happens actually at um, at the moment of the of your division being called up to go to the mat and start warming up. But that depends on the tournament. But generally, um, you show up early in the day. There is usually a rules meeting, for, you know, very early for those people that want to do it, and it's it's, it's good to just get a review and be able to ask questions. Because as I say, some some tournaments have different rules. They might count. You know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the points are pretty standard, but. 
you know, uh, generally foot locks, for example, are not allowed at all at the white belt, at foot belt level, at, at the blue belt level. You know, some tournaments allow straight foot locks that don't torque the knee to the side one side or the other, but some of them only allow straight foot locks where the foot is fully along one side of the person, not crossed in front of them, because having that, even if it's a straight foot lock, when it's being applied with the guy, when it's across the, your, your opponent's body, there's a chance that they're going to kind of sort of turn it into a modified heel hook, which can tweak the knee. So those kinds of, you know, some tournaments don't allow what's called slicers, where you're kind of cutting into the muscle with a lock. Uh, a, lot, a lot of them don't allow head cranks that are not chokes, but are specifically attacking the vertebrae of the neck. And so it just depends. And you want to learn that stuff, and you want to know it up front and know under what belt divisions it is or is not allowed, so you're very clear on that. Then um, usually they start with the lightest divisions and the lowest belt ranks. Um, so, uh, and if they have a women's division, they might sort of intermix that uh, in. But uh, so you can expect that if you're a very light, kind of a rooster weight, you know, very light fighter, white belt, your division will start first. They'll call you up to a mat. They'll make some sort of an announcement. And it, everyone in that division is to report to a mat. Most tournaments have different mats, like four or six mats going out at the same time. So you've got to be attentive to when your division is called. And then they'll, you know, that'll be your signal to start warming up. And you may still be waiting quite some time if it's a big division, you know, with, say, 16 people or something, then there's going to be eight fights, and then the winner of those eight fights will have, you know, more fights. So it may be a while before you, you get to fight. So the big problem in the tournament is always deciding, you know, when to warm up, when mm -hmm. and when are you getting close or when not to warm up. And it's a good idea to, you know, eat a good breakfast before because, generally speaking, you're always going to have much more waiting than you thought. And then keep some food with you and just keep eating throughout the day and, and don't starve yourself. But um, hopefully, you know, some of the better organized tournaments set times and they're getting pretty good at saying, okay, this division is probably going to start around 11 a.m., this division is probably going to start around 2 p.m., but almost always it's running late. Uh, and when they do do that, they won't start earlier than that, which is nice, but it's usually running late. Frequently, I've seen tournaments that run late into the night. Um, so I think the real word of wisdom there is bring food, bring liquid, assume that you're going to have a longer wait than you think you're going to have. And don't let yourself just get hungry and you suddenly don't want to have to go buy a hot dog or, you know, leave yourself to what food is there. Just come with whatever food you like and be prepared to have a long wait. Bring an iPod, bring a book, and bring a DVD player. Yeah. The, the one thing about iPods, and I'm very into that. I like listening to music and I find that very relaxing. But, of course, you've got to be careful because if you pop your headphones on you, and, and kind of get into the zone listening to music or even get immersed in reading a book, you want to be sure that you're still paying attention to the announcements. It's, it's really nice to have a friend with you who's not competing, um, or a friend who is, but when you have a friend who's not competing, they can, you know, they can sort of stay a little bit more attentive, and that can let you maybe go outside and rather than sitting inside in, in, you know, where all the shouting is going on, and you may find that that's causing you to not really be able to relax. Um, you go outside, sit down by a tree in the shade, listening to your music, do some light stretching or whatever, and you have someone who's on the inside who can kind of come out and say, hey, I think you're getting close to your division, and that way you don't have to stress about that. But So the one thing I would caution you about is if you do, are going to do something like reading a book or an iPod, do be sure that you don't get so immersed in it that you miss when they call out, it's your time to warm up, because I've seen that happen, and that's a very frustrating experience. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, if you are that friend or, or that coach, what what are your what's your take on coaching fighters? I, I've seen. I mean, I remember when I was competing a couple of times. I was listening to my coach with one ear, but I was listening to my opponent's coach with both ears because he was busy telling his his fighter exactly what to do and giving me a heads up on what he was going to do. I, I kind of had as much. I had a lot of forewarning. His coach is yelling, "Triangle your legs! Triangle your legs!" So I'm like, "Oh, he's going to triangle his legs. I, I better move right now." So how do you like to coach your students so that they, the opponent of your students can't take advantage of it? And also what's involved in coming up with a strategy sort of on the fly for, for fighting specific opponents? Well, let's, let's talk about the coaching part of that question first. I think that tournament coaching is a, an entirely a skill set in and of itself, and there are people who are great at it and people maybe who are not so great at it. Um, I felt very fortunate with uh, 
training under the Machados, I feel that they were great at it. Uh, and Zanjak and Higgin, who were usually in my corner, Zanjak Machado and Higgin Machado, were both really, really, really great coaches. And I learned a lot from them, uh, both both regular coaches you know, on the map, but also competition coaches, specifically corner men. Um, I think that it, it really helps to know your fighter, because if you... If, if the person who's coaching doesn't really know what the fighter is good at, then they, you know, and don't, and, and and there isn't sort of an unspoken, you know, communication going on. It's going to be a little bit tough to not say obvious things um, that your opponent is going to hear, like what you described there. Um, but if if you know your fighter, you don't have to talk in such specifics. Like you can say, play your game, do your move. You know, you can always, you can always warn someone specifically, like you can say, hey, he's setting up an arm bar or he's setting up for a sweep because you're not telling the opponent anything the opponent doesn't know. You're telling your guy something he may not know. But you, but it, you certainly don't want to say, hey, get the triangle or capture his arm or do things like that. And um, you have to trust at some point that fighters know what they know and they're as good as they're at. And if you have to tell someone to go ahead and try to get the triangle – why aren't they seeing that for themselves? So the, the hope is you, you generally don't coach people on, on specific techniques. The coach is really there to inform the fighter of how much time is left, what the points are, because it's not always obvious to the fighter if he earned or gave away points, and he needs to know that, he or she needs to know that, and then to give them inspirational coaching, you know, to let them know that they're doing a good job, and, and then when it comes to te- specific techniques, it's, it's really more telling you what the other person is doing, not what you should do. So I think that's the general rule. If, if I have to tell a fighter, grab his arm, um, I will do that if I think he's in a good position of control and the other fighter can't stop it. So you might as well just tell him what you want him to do and instruct him point by point because the other fighter maybe is not in a position to make use of that information. But generally, you shouldn't be having to tell your fighter, grab here, grab there, or anything specific to do. You just want to be telling them, you got three minutes left, you're doing great, um, you know, you're behind on two points, you know, you've got to make up the points, and, and then if they need some specific coaching, like pull to your guard, pull to your guard, if you see that their takedowns are not working and they're going to lose, you might want to encourage them, like pull and sweep, pull and sweep, and move them into a different area, and there, you are giving some information away to the other opponent, but, you know, it's the price of losing the match. But I'm not a big believer in, and I'm also not a believer at all in the coach getting excited. It's hard to hear, you know, a lot of people are screaming during the match. So if someone is trying to scream instructions at you, it really gets lost in the scream of the crowd. It's much easier to hear a coach who's talking calmly and in a lower level because that actually cuts through the crowd because no one else is talking calm in a low level. Um, so it allows you to sort of get a beat on, that partic- on your coach's voice and just listen. So I see a lot of times where coaches get very excited and, and they get all pumped up, and I don't think that helps the fighter. I think a calm voice of reason in the corner, reassuring the fighter, telling them the things that they obviously need to know that they may not know, and including the points and the time, is the ideal way to coach to be a corner coach for a fighter. Okay, so then what about the other aspect? That's the within-match um aspect of coaching what about the before match aspect of coaching how much do you think scouting out potential opponents in the bracket is the fighter's responsibility versus the coach's responsibility you know i think practically speaking the co- coaches don't really have a time to do that i mean you usually if, if a co- if a instructor is there he has or she has one, more than one student that's in the competition so it really may not be feasible for a coach to be you know, watching the early matches and taking note of, wow, that guy, you know, that guy's really good or that, that guy's really not good, and then your fighter may or may not be fighting that guy, you know, may never even see them in the bracket. I mean, it's great if a coach is generally aware, and it's easier as, the, as you get higher up in the belt rankings because there's fewer people. And especially if you, do, if you do a lot of competition, then you'll start to see the same people again and again, and you may compete against them again and again, so you do have a chance to kind of get to know their game. But I generally don't think it's really feasible for a coach to step out into a tournament and do much in the way of scouting in each division because they've got people going on in different divisions and they're trying to watch their own fighters. So I think it's really the fighter's responsibility, if they get a chance to, is to watch the matches that are occurring before them, and that way they get a chance to see, okay, well, that guy won, so if I win my match, I might be with that guy, and I noticed, wow, he's a really good throw. I better watch out for that. Um, and so I would answer that this more in the 
practically speaking, it, it needs to be more the individual fighter because they're the ones that are sitting in their bracket watching every fight while the coach may be distracted and running back and forth to different mats and will only come back to your mat when it's your actual fight. You're actually sitting there watching your whole bracket fight when, until it gets to be your time. So you as a fighter have the opportunity to see what else is going on. That being said, I think that there's not too much reconnaissance that really can be done. I mean, you, you know, you can know pretty quickly, you know, that this guy is a judoka or a wrestler and they're good at that, but you would, you'd find that out within the first couple seconds of, of your own match anyway. So it certainly helps to know if someone is good at something, but uh, I think it's, it's of only limited use because at the end of the day, they may be good at, you may have seen them execute something well, but that doesn't mean they're going to be able to execute it well against you. So... Um, you just kind of figure things out as you go once you actually get on the mat with the opponent. I do, however, think it's important to, to have a general game plan worked out with yourself and your coach. Um, even though things may divert, you know, divert from that game plan very quickly, but a concept of at least what are you going to do at the start of the fight? Because if you kind of come out there with, as a blank slate, you're really saying to the other person, okay, we're playing chess, you make the first move. Um, and you want to always take the first move. You want to put pressure on the other fighters so that they have to respond and get into your game. So if you're, a, if you're good at takedowns, then you want to be the one to initiate the takedown. You want to be the one, in the, you know, because every time you initiate something, someone has to respond, and those responses are usually finite. So if I just walk out onto the mat and don't do anything, then there's an infinite number of moves the other person can launch at me. They could pull to their guard. They could sweep. They could shoot in for a takedown. They could try a judo throw. They could do a flying arm bar, you know, who knows what they could do, because it's infinite, because I haven't put them under any pressure that's going to limit their options. If I shoot in immediately for a takedown, I know one of two things is going to happen. I'm going to take them down or they're going to sprawl, and that limits their options. So basically that means they're going to sprawl, because if I didn't get what I wanted and I have to continue, I know they're going to sprawl, and I can have a follow-up move, and I do, ready for when someone stalls. I know exactly where I'm going. So by taking the initiative, rather than being passive, I've immediately brought the person into my world, so they have to, from, from the moment that the match begins, start reacting to what I do and maybe not get into their game plan, which might have been something totally different, like pulling for triangle or, or, or something else that I will never even have to experience because I, I never let them get into their game plan. So, and as I say, once you start, things can, you know, very, very quickly will, will become not what you planned, and you might think you were going to do the first takedown and they shot in first or they did some reaction, and, you know, pretty quickly you're into it and then you're into your general skill set. But I do think you want to take that advantage of having a particular game plan, knowing what you want, certainly at the, for the beginning of the fight and any time the fight is restarted, because, you know, fights begin sometimes several times. If you go off the mat, they get started over again. And a general game plan, too, like just knowing, well, I have this sweep and it's good, so... Whatever happens, I'm going to try to move back into this area where I can do my sweep because once I do that, I kind of get into my flow. So, yeah, there's a, there's a great quote that uh, no plan of action survives contact with the enemy, but, you're th- but that's still not a reason not to have a plan of action. No. Action, action uh, plan beats no plan. There's no question about it. And, and you know, like I say, in, in, in tournament, tournaments, you're, you're awarded by, for aggressiveness. So, um, you know, if there are no points scored, whoever is initiating more should be the person who's given the victory. And so you want to start, you want to get that into the referee's brain right from moment one that you're the initiator. Even if that means pulling to your guard. If you've got a very good guard and you're very confident that you can pull someone to your guard, then fine, initiate by pulling someone to your guard. You know, or pulling for an immediate sweep or pulling for an immediate attempt at a finish. But, you know, putting people under pressure makes them, it limits their options of what they can do because they have to react to what you're dishing out. They can't do their favorite move necessarily because they're busy reacting to the move you just tossed at them. And, and the ideal fight, you would continue tossing that out at them it, without stop until they tapped out or the fight was over and you won on points and they never got to get into their game. Since I dragged out one quote, I'll drag out the other one. I think it was Bobby Fisher who said that it's not playing the move that's best for you. It's playing the move that's worst for your opponent. And so you're saying that by imposing your game, you're keeping your opponent from getting his game off the ground. Right. Okay. So a lot of the questions that I'm coming up with are actually not actually my own questions. They're questions from my readership, uh, from my Grappling Tips newsletter and my beginning Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu newsletter. 
And one of the most common questions with regards to competition goes something like this. It's, I really like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I want to compete. And we never wear takedowns at my gym. We spend 90 to 95% of the time on the ground, but I don't want to fight on the bottom. So what is, uh, what's a good option for me? What's a good takedown and a good takedown defense to start with? And uh, how should I bridge the gap between that standing game and the ground game that I've so laboriously worked on in class? Yeah, well, um, I mean, there's a couple of different answers to that. Obviously, a first answer is labo- spend a little time laboriously working on your takedowns. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no there's no magic solution for for not having an arsenal in takedowns. You know, it's it's nice if you can start the match and have a reasonable threat, and and scoring a takedown at the beginning of the match is a great way to get you to the ground because it gets you your two points. Um, so, I mean, just speaking to that, I would say that the reason that um, that a lot of schools don't practice takedowns, there's, there's really two reasons. One reason is frequently the instructors themselves are, are, aren't all that skilled. I mean, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, as it developed in Brazil, didn't really emphasize the sport aspect of takedowns. Um, you know, when they were doing Valley Tudo and no rules competitions, they had a few entries against, uh, you know, guys who were swinging and kicking, and basically it's not that easy to knock someone out when they're charging at you, and, and that was really all that was needed. Now, now as the sport has developed, and, and we're talking about both MMA where there is still strikes, but, but in the sport where there aren't strikes, people are much more sophisticated in terms of defenses against takedowns, and you've got a lot of wrestlers who've been doing takedowns since they were little kids. So the need for having a more sophisticated take down offense and defense has grown and sometimes some of the instructors, you know, that that's just not where they're coming from, so it's not their strong suit. Also, in practice, as you know, um, takedowns take a lot of space and when you're practicing every night, you know, if you've got a class filled with people and you must start doing takedowns, I mean some of the people are actually be have to be standing along the side, protecting the wall. And it also does increase the likelihood of injury because you have the forces of, you know, gravity smashing you down. So there's good reasons why we don't do a lot of takedowns in most Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu classes. But as your listeners or your, your questioners have pointed out, that, that leads to a problem when it comes to competition because you feel a little bit out of your, out of your realm. So I would say one, one answer to that is spend a little time doing takedowns. And if that means doing it outside of class or if that means you know, stopping by your local judo club or wrestling club or, you know, local high school wrestling coach or whatever, it's good if you can get a little time um, spent with takedowns. And, and a lot of the Jiu Jitsu instructors are open to having the local college wrestling coach maybe come in once a month to help work on takedowns, and, and uh, that's, that's a great solution for acquiring some skill. But on the shorter term, just to answer the question of what, what do I do if I don't have that skill? Um, you know, it's very important to remember that you can pull to the guard if, and that's not a bad competition strategy, even if you want to be on top, so long as your intention is to pull to the guard with the intention of sweeping or finishing. And that's a really important distinction. And my coach, Higgin Machado, used to really, really drill that into us. Um, he would say he would forbid us to pull to the guard just for the purpose of landing someone in the guard generically. And his point of view was, if you pull to the guard, you are specifically pulling for the purpose of immediately initiating a sweep. So um, what I would suggest is that you practice. Um, There are certain sweeps that are really ideal for when someone is standing. Um, And, um, you know, they're called by different things, but they can involve, you know, grabbing the person's heel and putting your foot on their hip and the other foot behind their knee, and kind of sweeping them down that way. Um, so, and, there, and there's a number. You can, and there's also, of course, flying triangle things where you can pull to the guard and immediately try to execute a finish, or flying armbar, things like that, but those can be a little iffy because they can leave you in a bad situation. But what you can start to do is ask your instructor, you know, what would he say are the best fast sweeps for when you just pull someone to the ground and maybe they're still on their feet? and start to work those sweeps. So it becomes, in a sense, a takedown strategy of yours to sit back on your, on your backside, but immediately do that while holding the person's collar, holding the person's sleeve for the purpose of setting up a sweep. 
And that can work. And then if it fails, you're not penalized for being defensive and pulling to the guard because you did try to initiate something. And then the worst case scenario is the person ends up in your guard and hopefully you have a whole plan of attack and plan of sweep from your guard. So it's almost um, another, bridging the gap between a sacrifice throw in judo and a sweep in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's a flying, it's a flying sweep. Yeah, I, exactly. Although I would even call it a little bit more, a little bit more money in the bank than just a sacrifice throw. I mean, if you work out, uh, it's hard for me to describe just just in words. But for example, if you get a, use your left hand to hold someone's right sleeve sleeve tip, which is pretty easy to get uh, standing, and then you sit yourself to the ground, and immediately what you're shooting for is your right hand around uh, the back of their left heel. That's, that's pretty attainable. And then if, you, and if you're able to at the same time get your right foot up onto their hip, uh, I realize there's a lot of description that maybe doesn't work well over the podcast, and your left foot behind their right knee, you, you're in a situation where you can suddenly kick them back with your right foot down to the ground and they can't post with their right arm because you, you're holding their sleeve and they can't step back with their other foot because you're holding their heel. And that's pretty easy to jump to that position. And there's a number of sweeps that come off of the person's defense against that. So it's not really that you're just jumping to something. You really, it's attainable. You're, you're holding their sleeve and then boom, you're on the ground, you're holding their heel and your feet are doing their thing and they're, and they better have very, very good balance to be able to react, react quickly or they're going down. Um, so there are sweeps, and I would say talk to your instructor um, and ask what are some of those sweeps and work them. And they would generally be the types of sweeps you would do when someone is standing up in your open guard. Um, and, and it's just sort of a free spider guard or an open guard. And what are the sweeps from there? Those would be the sweeps that you can set up from standing and jump down to. And that, another good um, uh, good move that I use, and this is actually um, described in my book, is I would, sh- you know, you can shit in for, for a double leg takedown, knowing full well that you don't have good penetration skills and it's very likely the person is going to s- defend by sprawling on top of you. And you can plan for that, so when they sprawl on top of you, the most likely thing they're going to then do is spin around and try to move towards your back. And if as they're spinning uh, towards your side, you, you can kind of lay on your side and catch them in a half guard. Um, again, difficult to script to describe on the podcast, but it's a predictable response that someone will do when you shoot at their legs that they will first sprawl, and then if they, you don't have their legs, they will immediately spin and try to get your back. And that gives you plenty of time as they're spinning to also lean off to your side and kind of catch them between your, your legs, not in a full guard, which you could do, but in a half guard and then immediately go back to your feet or get aggressive again, and, and there's, again, a number of sweeps and attacks from there. So it's basically a way of using a shooting, shooting in as a method of closing the distance when you know you don't have the skill to actually complete the takedown, but you're not even trying to complete the takedown. You're basically inviting the guy to come and begin to grapple with you on the ground, but you have, a, again, a game plan. You have a plan for how you're going to deal with their reaction that doesn't involve you're just letting them get your back or, or lying down on your butt. So you can basically use shoots as entries to cover the distance and plan on failing on your takedown since your takedown skills are not so good, but then have an immediate backup plan for what the person's likely going to do that does take you into an aggressive ground game, and it's a way of closing the distance. Uh, I don't know how well that works describing it over a podcast. Well, I think people are familiar with that. I mean, Minotauro did that exact same strategy in Pride a number of times, or it looked like it. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, it, um, well, I guess, I, I guess the, my point there is you do, even if you can't execute the takedown, you can initiate a takedown. You can initiate, I mean, your other opportunity is just stand there and defend. And, and, and hope the other person's going to shoot in, and you can defend and sprawl on them and maybe start working from the top from them. That's always possible to do. That The problem with that is you're kind of running a risk that the other person may be quite good at takedowns. And if you don't feel, and generally people who aren't really good at executing takedowns aren't that good at defending them either, because if they were, that would mean they'd be spending a lot of time, you know, learning them and with people who are good at them. But, but so that you can, use, you can use your lack of skill as a takedown offense nonetheless as an initiator, basically making that first chess move 
knowing full well what the other person's likely next move is going to be, and you could have your, your next move ready to, to go. Well, on a, on a related note, what if the – and somebody was uh, wanting an answer to this, and I have an answer, but I'm interested in hearing what your answer is because you're the star, you're the star, star guest of today's, uh, today's podcast – what if the other person doesn't want to engage you on the ground? Maybe they've already up a couple of points, and their whole strategy is to back off. And um, you see this a lot in no-gi, where one person is trying to engage the other person. Maybe they even pull guard. As soon as they open the guard and start playing an open guard game, the other person backs away. The, other, uh, the person on the ground ends up doing a bunch of butt scooting and gets penalized or, or is told to stand up again. So what? If, and the other person is just trying to wait for the clock to run out. Maybe they're they're uh, they're up a few points, or they're waiting until the very last thirty seconds of the match to do their takedown and then defend wildly for for thirty seconds. So what what suggestions do you have there for open guard players, especially in a no gi context? Yeah, you know that can be tough, and that's a, that's a skill that you know, and that's like a, a someone playing the rules essentially. And playing the points, and and I've seen wrestlers do that because they they're good, they don't want to engage on the ground, or maybe they did, but you threatened them with a the triangle, and now their idea is, hey man, I'm just going to shoot my takedown, sit on my my lead, and I don't want to get involved with this guy because it's dangerous. And and honestly, that's that's legitimate. It's fair. Um, it's within the rules. And one thing I would say before we talk about the physical technique is that's when it's good to have a corner coach who can advocate for you. Um, fighters generally should not advocate. They shouldn't talk to the referee or complain. Unless there's something really, you know, if someone is doing something illegal and you need to call the attention to the referee, it's like, hey, he's grabbing me here, or hey, he's, you know, doing something like that the referee's not seeing. But a good corner coach can start to complain to the referee that he's backing away, he's running from the fight, and get the, get the referee to start putting some pressure and threaten to pull away points. Because frequently it's obvious when someone is doing that, when they're not really wanting to engage, and someone needs to be calling that attention loud and clear and respectfully to the referee so the referee can start to advocate and get on your side and tell them to start engaging. But um, apart from that, you know, it, it is difficult. If someone doesn't want to close distance with you and, you're, and you want to sit down and fight from your guard and they don't want to close distance from you, it is going to be hard for you to, you know, butt scoot forward and sort of corner them if, if they are if they're willing to circle around and move back. Now, there are people who are confident, you know, you can, t- you can turn and, like, turn into a turtle and just basically be challenging the person to come and engage and take hold of you. Um, and if they don't do that, then it becomes sort of a discussion with the referee of who's the person who's stalling you. You're turning onto your hands and knees. They're not taking advantage of a golden opportunity to jump on your back. Um, so I've seen people try that. You, uh, what I would suggest from that situation is you've got to stand up and you've got to chase them down. Um, you've got to force them into a corner and you've got to make it obvious that they're running from the fight. And again, having someone as you're doing that complaining to the referee that this person is running and running and running, it, you know, you want to get the referee advocating for you. So I guess I don't, I don't know what your answer to that is, Stefan, but my basic answer is if the person is standing and will not engage, you got to stand up too, and you got to shoot, and you got to take them down, and you got to corner them, or you got to shove them into the corner, or do something to force them to engage, or make it darn obvious that they're running from the fight. The well, and the the point about your your corner or your coach advocating for you uh, loudly, clearly, and respectfully is well taken. I guess my, the only thing I would have to add to that is uh, uh, is something that. Uh, Ricardo Laborio pointed out when I was talking to him, and that it's a lot harder to run away from somebody if you're caught in their half guard than in their open guard. So if you, it's often difficult to get close guard if your game is pulling guard and you and you want to pull close guard and the guy's intent on defending that. That can be tough to get sometimes, but but if if you manage to capture one of their legs in half guard then it's often a lot harder for the guy to stand up and run away because in doing so, he often exposes himself to a whole bunch of sweeping opportunities. Oh, yeah. No, no, I would agree. I was assuming by the question that the person, the you're, not able, you're not able to engage. He's just, he's stepping back and he's not, you're not able to get your hands on him. Yeah, if you're able to get your hands on the person um, and then they keep backing away, I would agree with that. In fact, you definitely want to take a look at uh, Marcelo Garcia, 
Um, he mean, he's a master at, tr- at, at arm drags to, to half guards and, and, you know, ha- having a monstrous series of bad things start happening to his opponents because of that. So he basically, his attack, his, his takedown is arm drag, which is a wrestling move where you're pulling the person with, the, with your right arm, you're pulling the person's left elbow across your body and as a means of basically spinning them and getting to the back. But what he'll do is he'll, he'll do a quick arm drag as a way of pulling his own body, launching into half guard, basically like sliding into home base in a baseball game. And, and, not, and, and if he can drag the person to the ground in half guard, so much the better. But even if the person doesn't come down, he's basically using that a way of diving in onto his butt, catching the person's foot between his legs, and then immediately latching onto it for a single leg takedown, spinning around and... And it's, he, he can cover some amazing distance that, well, that way, and it's kind of an unusual takedown, but, man, he's made a career out of it. Well, if somebody is watching this and they haven't, um, and they haven't seen it, I would definitely recommend that they go to YouTube and look for Marcelo Garcia highlight, because you'll see that exact move that you're describing again and again, and it, it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, what about um, conditioning? If you're... If you're Looking to compete, say, uh, a couple of months away, what do you think are the most important aspects of conditioning? Where do you fall on the whole aerobic versus anaerobic versus weightlifting versus muscular endurance versus power, uh, you know, developing those different modalities? Which is the most important? How do you mix them? You know, uh, I fall in the take steroids. No, just kidding, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, what well, basically I, um, you know, different people have different physiology. Some people are stockier and, and, and by the way, have different games. Some people have jujitsu games that rely more on explosion and, and for them strength is important. Some people have games that rely more on flexibility and, and kind of, you know, setting traps and for them flexibility and endurance and sort of a tendon, kind of a, what I call tenacious tendon strength as opposed to explosive muscular strength is important for their game. So to some extent, that answer kind of depends on what's your game and what's your body type. But I, I think in general, you know, you, you, most people tend to fall too far, in my opinion, on the side of weightlifting and building bulk and trying to build explosive strength. You know, that's easy to do. Uh, and, and it's also relatively painless. I mean, sitting around at the gym you know, you can, you can do that in a relaxed manner. It's not that hard, and so people tend to fall towards the path of least resistance. Let's be honest, good aerobic training means, you know, it's tough, and it means you're going to be running or you're going to be running on the treadmill or you're going to be wrestling hard, and it really is going to tax your endurance, whereas you can build up muscular strength with your friends at the gym while you're listening to music and having a nice time. So I think that most people fall a little bit too far on not, not doing enough aerobic and not doing enough of what I would call anaerobic training where they're doing their weightlifting or doing their wrestling, but doing it while they're oxygen deprived. And that's a very important skill that you want to have, and you want to get your body used to operating and exploding when you're in a state of oxygen deprivation. So um, my training, you know, I, I have what I refer to as homework. That would be anything that you're doing off the mat, the kind of stuff that you can do at night or before you go to work or or whatever that doesn't require partners and doesn't require time on the mat. And for that, um, that would be um, a series of weight, weightlifting exercises, uh, exercises, mostly with free weights but not necessarily, but that mimic the movements that you're going to do in a jiu-jitsu match. So basically speaking for your upper body, that would be curls and push-ups or bench presses. Those would be obviously the moves that you use to pull people in or choke or push people away or block, you know, hold someone away. Um, you know, you could do uh, pull- pullovers or, um, you know, pull-ups as a means of working your takedown, the ability of pulling someone back in, as well as seated rows. Those would be the exercises of motion you would be using to pull someone towards you for a takedown to pull their legs or to pull your elbow back if someone has got you in their guard and doing a, 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 an arm bar. Then, of course, sit-ups, crunches in all directions um, would be important, um, and often with the squeezing a ball between your legs. At, to mimic squeezing a person between your legs as you're sitting up and working your guard. And then for your legs, you, the, the basic exercises I would just toss out there are leg, you know, seated leg extensions and leg curls. Leg extensions would be obviously lifting someone up when you're sitting on your butt and you're lifting with your hooks. And the leg curls 
uh, pulling with the hamstring would help, as well as groin, you know, kind of, um, you know, there's machines that allow you to squeeze your knees together. That's always good for strength and closed guard. But main thing on the curls would be, you know, to be able to lock your legs, but also be able to defend against arm bar, I mean, leg bars, excuse me. So those are just sort of basic exercises that mimic um, movements in jiu-jitsu. So I would call out, take a look at the exercises, at the weightlifting exercises you're doing, and ask yourself, is the motion that I'm doing, whatever the exercise is, is this a motion? Squats, by the way, are great, too, if you don't hurt your back, because that would give you the strength to stand up with someone with their legs around you. But um, is this motion directly relevant to my fighting game, or is this just something for vanity or something I've been doing for a lot of years? to build up my traps or to give me nice shoulders or something. But in fact, you'll see a lot of way, the ways people do, for example, bench press with their arms spread very wide. You don't do that in grappling. You don't want to let your arms get away. You, you're generally p- keeping your elbows against your body and pushing away and pushing yourself away. And to mimic that, you'd be talking about either push-ups or bench presses with your elbows in very close and using more of your tricep strength and possibly a lower weight. So, People just need to take a look at the exercises they're doing and make sure that they're relevant to grappling, first of all. But then, in terms of ramping up for a competition, I would say, yeah, you want to you want to build up some bulk early on, and then you'll taper off, of course, in the week before competition to let your body, uh, you know, relax relax a bit and recover. But um, building up some strength with um, higher weights is good. Um, but I really key in on that aerobic stuff. I'm very into running. I'm very into for me, I don't run more than four miles. That's an issue of um, uh, that's an issue of you know just don't like to spend that much time pounding on my joints. But also, you know, your, your jiu-jitsu match is going to be at most if you're at the black belt level ten minutes. Then you want to have really good endurance because you want to be able to recover. But to me, it makes less sense to be running for an hour. You know, because gen- again, you're not mimicking what's going on in the jiu-jitsu match. Jiu-jitsu match involves ex- explosion and rest periods and explosion. So I like to run a few miles of the warm-up, so that might be 30 minutes of running max, and then start a series of sprints where I unpredictably, you know, will sprint 100 yards. Sorry for my Canadian friends that I'm speaking in uh, non-metric terms, but I am American. Um, but uh, run 100 yards, uh, you know, then, then jog 10 yards, then suddenly explode, run 30 yards, jog 5 yards, just unpredictably explode, the key being start running again before I'm ready because that's really the feeling you have in a competition is, is it's time to explode before you're fully recovered. That can occur because an opportunity opens up or maybe the referee stands you up and says go and you'd really like to take an extra minute to fix your belt and catch your breath, but you got to go. Um, so um, I think that ideally, too, in the gym when you're doing your weightlifting, and this speaks to that anaerobic thing I was mentioning uh, this is something that Jean-Jacques Machado talked to, to me about and used to do very effectively, and, and I really like it, is to get on the treadmill and sprint. Crank the thing up to a scary speed that you're really taking it up to a full-on sprint. Watch your step that you go flying off the treadmill. Do that for two minutes if you can. Get yourself completely gassed and out of breath, and then go ahead and do your weightlifting set. So you're doing your normal weightlifting set while you are out of breath, and as soon as you feel your heart rate start to drop or you're catching your breath again, and then maybe after just one rep, um, one, one set of reps, get back on the treadmill and get yourself tired again. So what you're really doing is you're working your weightlifting, but you're doing it not in that relaxed talking to your buddy, listening to your iPod state I was referring to, but you're doing it in a completely out-of-breath state, helping to train your muscles to work anaerobically. And, of course, the best training prior to a competition is the grappling itself because that's exactly what's happening when you're grappling. And I would say that you need to ramp up the intensity level to build up your endurance on the mat as well. So you need to have partners knowing that you're training for a competition. And a great way to do that is if you, if you have the luxury of doing this is to have fresh partners rotate in onto you and rotate in uh, into good positions. So maybe you've been wrestling for two minutes, you're tired, boom, a new fresh person walks in and they start on your back with the hooks in. And then keep yourself under pressure. So... We, you know, like say, I've got two minutes and I'm down by three points, go. And then as soon as those two minutes are up, whatever has happened, bring in another fresh person, they're on the mount, you've got two minutes and you're down by one point, go. Um, and by doing that, you're forcing yourself to work in a zone of heightened 
um, you know, heightened energy when you're tired, and, and ultimately that's the best way to mimic what's going on in the competition. So I don't know if that answered your 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 question, but that's sort of my general game plan in terms of conditioning prior to a competition. Okay, David. So that's great information about competing in general, but how soon after starting Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu do you think is uh, a good time to start competing? Do you just jump in and, and sink or swim, or do you take some time and, and only start competing after a certain amount of time? Well, um, uh, you know, more power to you if you're a person that's just going home and wants to jump into a competition so long as you feel like you have enough skills to, you know, to stay safe, which basically means know how to tap fast. If, if you think something, you know, obviously you don't want to be competing if you don't understand when you're in danger and you don't realize, wow, this is an arm bar, I think, you know, this has the potential to hurt me. So in that sense, I would not, I would just discourage people from just jumping into a competition immediately. But if they understand, you know, the basics of what are the moves where I'm going to need to submit here before I feel pain and injury, um, then I think, sure, if, you, if you're a gung-ho kind of person and you want to jump out there and experience competition, even though, you know, at a white belt level, um, you know, more power to you. Like I say, just don't get injured and be sure you understand jiu-jitsu enough to know that, wow, I'm caught in a joint lock move here. Don't wait until it hurts. Give up. Um, but basically speaking, you know, I, I think, and this, you know, and I would even back it up to when you should start even grappling in your class. In, you know, when I learned, and I'm sure when you learned, and it, this is certainly the way it's in virtually every Brazilian jiu-jitsu and submission grappling class, People are often put to grapple on day one. I mean, they come to the class, they learn what the mount is, they learn a move or two, and then it's time for the class to start grappling, and they say, sure, go in and grapple. And, and I'm, I'm not a believer in that at all. I think that, you know, people can certainly weather that. I weathered it. Most people do. But, but it's like someone in a boxing ring, you know, on their first day and saying, great, now box, and, and you know, beating them up. You're, you're, you're set of setting the person up for failure and you're setting the person up for an experience that they can't even understand why they're losing. You know, if, you're, if your goal is to sort of show them why Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is great and, and they need, you know, an attitude adjustment or something, well, that's fine. But most people don't. Most people are there because they are interested in learning. They understand it's power. So, so my belief is um, go ahead and get some basic skills before you even start competitively grappling at all, and, and even before you begin total free-form competitive grappling, you know, maybe once you've been to a few classes, you understand some positions, you understand some transitions between the positions, maybe you have a finish or two, go ahead and start having a very controlled grappling where maybe, okay, you start on the mount and your goal is to keep, stay on the mount and the other person's goal is to get out, and if they get out, you switch. So you are doing, you know, competitive grappling, but in very limited areas. And um, so that's my general approach and when you start training at all. So I would think you should have gone that before you, through that before you go ahead and jump into a competition. Although I, I would basically say, and, and other instructors may disagree, you know, if you have a basic skill set, as long as you know how to keep yourself safe and know how to tap, if you are inspired and want to go into a competition, I would encourage you to do it because it will just be fun and more inspiration and it will just set as a goal for you. Okay, well, what about the, the flip side of that? Um, how old is too old to compete? Or alternately, and maybe more to the point, how injured and beaten up and broken down is too injured or beaten up or broken down to compete? Never too old. Never too old. You're talking to a guy who's 46 years old, and I eat 20-year-olds for breakfast, and still <laughs> I'm hungry. Um, so um, obviously, I, I don't think the issue is age. I, I do think you're, you're very you're right on the button there. The issue is is are you injured, you know, or can you afford, you know? Oh, let's be honest. What, the benefit that that I had said earlier when we were speaking of uh, one of the benefits of jumping into a competition is that you're in an unfamiliar situation. You, you know, stress levels are up. You don't know what the other person is going to do, and and. You know, we have to be honest that those are the very factors that can increase the chances of injury. You know, you, it's unpredictable, you're tense, so you do need to have a heightened awareness of the potential for, you know, injury. And if you are already injured or if you are old and, and you, you have a really bum knee or a bum shoulder or something like that, you definitely want to take, take that into account. So, But on the age issue, I would say, 
you know, you're, you're never too old. So long as you're in, in physical shape, that you're okay to take that heightened level of stress and unpredictability, and you don't have any particular injury that you're risking, you know, and you feel that you're generally in good shape and you do a good warm-up, um, I think that you're never too old. The, the only caveat I'd add to that is, unfortunately, you know, and understandably, there's fewer and fewer competitors as you get into the, uh, the master's bracket and the senior bracket. So if you're looking to compete against people close to your own age, which is reasonable, you may find that there is no one to compete with or you're going to have to go through the cost and the effort to get there and you're only going to have one match because maybe only one person in your age bracket. So, you know, you may then choose to drop age brackets, which is what I do. I usually drop down to two. So I'm 46 and I usually wrestle in the 30 to 35 age division because I feel like that's good competition for me and gives me enough people to sort of make it fun. I can go, I, I sometimes will go into the normal division too, although these days I only compete in, in international competition like the world championship, things like that. And, you know, to be quite honest, those guys, it's, it's not even that they're younger and stronger, you know, but they have more time to train. They don't have stuff going on in their life. And, and so I'm not as likely to win and not as likely to get more matches. And keep in mind, my goal, as I mentioned earlier, is to learn it's not necessarily to win per se, it's to get as many matches as I can and grow as a fighter. So my best chance for doing that, I find, is in the 30 to 35 age range where, where there are plenty of guys to fight and I have a good chance of you know, being competitive and winning, so I will get more than one fight. But, um, so I don't think the age thing is an issue per se. I do, however, think that the injury thing is a serious issue. You know, we all are we're fighters, we're warriors, and, and I'm a big proponent of saying, hey, you know, you want to be prepared at any time for a fight. You know, if someone attacks you on the street, you can't say, time out, my knee is sore today, can you come back tomorrow? You know, that's true. And so we like to use, you know, we, we want to be tough, and we like to use the chance of a competition to push that. But there is a point at which if you are injured or sick, where, and I've learned from experience on this, it just doesn't make sense to compete. In, in terms of being sick, you're not going to compete at your, you're just not going to be able to, to, to execute and it's frankly unfair to the other fighters. You don't want to get anybody else sick. So I would say if you're under the weather, that's just bad luck. Don't compete. Come back another day when you're feeling good. And in terms of the injury, you know, that's a personal choice you have to make. We all know the price for making an injury worse, worse can, can be a lot of mistraining. And, and so, you know, if, if, if something is sore and you can tape it up and work around it, and even if that means that there are certain moves that you're just not going to do, that's fair enough, and you, you can go into the competition understanding that. But if you've recently had an injury and you're maybe just back or, or you're really kind of nursing it along, you really got to think long and hard about do you really want to subject yourself to a situation where you're likely going to get adrenalized, you're not going to feel the pain, you're not going to pay attention to it, you're not going to want to tap, and then you're going to walk off the mat perhaps with something that's going to keep you from training for a month or, or, or worse, depending upon the injury. I always warn people, um, and because this is something I just see time and time again, what will happen is people will get some sort of a relatively minor injury, like they'll pull something, and then they'll maybe take a day or two off or take you know some time off of the injury, and there's always that point at which you feel good enough to train again. And that's the most dangerous moment, because when you feel good enough to train again, is the intersection of you're a little bit out of shape because you missed you, know, you missed some training. Your your injury is at the least healed spot it has been when you're going to subject yourself to training again, and you're super eager to get back on the mat. And that's a recipe for turning that little injury into a big injury. And I see that time and time again. So you don't want to let competition bring you into that trap either. You want to say, am I actually healed enough? to feel confident that I can seriously explode and, and this is going to work. And if you can't answer yes to that, then it, for, for the sake of your longevity as a fighter, you probably want to let that competition slip by. There will be another one in a month or in a couple of months. You'll be better, and, and you just don't want to. You know, injury is the enemy, uh, honestly. Being, you know, anything that keeps you from training is the enemy. That will destroy your training. So you avoid injury at all costs. Okay. I, I completely agree. I, I've always thought that there were... There's a for every one world class world champion guy. There's a hundred people who had the potential and were en route to be that the same level and have the same achievements. And then somewhere along their career, they got uh, completely uh, cut short by injury. So let's let's not, try not to do that to our own uh, 
world quality, world class. No, and, and I agree. And, and honestly, I'd, I'd use that opportunity to put in a plug for real good homework, what I call before. You know, you're off the mat, really good. You know, get, keep yourself in shape, keep your body in shape. I do advocate some weightlifting to keep your connective, you know, tissues strong. And, and in, in jiu-jitsu, you know, and in submission grappling, we tend to work certain areas, you know, a lot, and certain area, other areas not at all. And you want to keep your body in a good general balance. So your weightlifting is your good is your chance to, you know, methodically and scientifically make sure that all joints and connections in your body are strong. And I'm a huge advocate of yoga um, and uh, keeping yourself very flexible and pliable. Obviously, the more flexible you are, if you get tweaked into a position and your body can go there comfortably, you won't get an injury. So I just can't emphasize enough the importance of warm up and you know, both doing your homework and then good warm-ups before your training. Whenever you train, you just don't skimp on that, or you will learn the hard way, as we all have, that, wow, I should have warmed up better. Um, you know, you just, you, we, we're, we all think that we're superhuman, but at the end of the day, we need that blood flow, we need that warmth, and that will help prevent injuries, and I just can't emphasize that enough. Okay. Well, why don't we, uh, this has been an awesome interview, why don't we just finish up with two quick uh Two of your favorite techniques when, um, let's say, you're in the guy's closed guard and he's up a, a point or two, or the referee is his coach, and uh, you know <coughs> unless you score some points in a hurry, uh, you're going to lose. So one move to use against someone who's stalling when you're in their closed guard and one move to use against someone who's stalling and they're in your closed guard. Um. Okay, it's a little hard to describe technical moves via the Oh, you did really well before. It, it, I, have, uh, I, have, I have faith in you. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, well, we'll assume for the sake of argument that we've got our gis on. It's, it's a little easier to stall with gis because you can hold the gi and hold someone down tighter. It's a little harder to stall when you're doing submission grappling without the gi. But, so if you're in the person's closed guard and they're stalling you, by definition that probably means they're trying to break down your posture and, you know, they're keeping their legs locked, of course, but they're, they're trying to break down their posture. So um, you, my, my preferred move would be to always be you got to stand up. Try to stand up. That gets gravity working for you, and, and that gives you the opportunity to start to force their legs open. Um, and if they're doing a successful job of, um, as when I say stand up, what I mean by that usually in, in, in my world, that would mean if possible, Go ahead and get, let's just say, your left hand on their chest. As we are talking about a gi. Try to gather up both of their lapels and hold them together with your left hand. When you're holding someone, both of someone's lapels, it makes it hard for them to push your hand off to either side of the body because when they push their hand off, their gi tightens up. And so by holding both lapels, you get support in both directions. And then your other hand or fist down towards their hip, pressing down on their hip, holding their hip down to defend against an arm bar against the other hand that's holding the lapels. And then go ahead and looking up to the sky like you would if you were doing a squat with weight on your shoulders and stepping up one leg at a time and actually standing up. And, and if they don't let go, then they're going to stand up. They're going to be in the air with you, which then makes it possible for you to start to go ahead and bounce a bit, put some, put, you know, put hand pressure on their knees and start to pressure to get their legs open and then immediately start guard pass as soon as they hit the ground so you can make up a point deficit. But generally speaking, if they're stalling, it can mean they're doing a good job of keeping your posture pulled down. So it's hard for you to get that posture up and to make that stand up. Now, if that's the case and, and they've, you know, got your arms locked up or, or they've um, got their legs kind of climbed up high on your shoulders so it's hard for you to step up, you can step up out of posture and keep, keep in mind here, you're, you're looking at a, a loss, so you're going to have to start to take some chances. And what you do in that case is keep your head down low and stand up with your butt high. So you are in the anti-posture now. Your legs are standing, but your head is bent down very low, which is putting you at risk for our bars and triangles because, you know, you're still in their range of attack. Um, and then I place my feet in a single line. So I line up my right foot behind my left foot. So I'm standing, butt's in the air, head down. They're holding my head and arms I'm down low. And I stand my left foot in front of my right foot, and then I squat down, basically... Um, trying to find that space in between their legs, even though their legs are closed, you know, in, in front of me, their legs are closed, and I squat down with my left knee then sort of punches up into that space, and then I can use my shin to press them back away. 
Um, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of describing it, but it's a, it's a typical move that's used against someone who's climbed their legs up really high, which is a great way to stall and attack you. And so by doing that, they've allowed you to stand up with your butt high in the air and then kind of sit back and punch a knee through the little space, you know, in their groin area between their legs. But um, bottom line, what I'm saying is you have to you have to do what's available to you. So if you can't if you can't free your upper body and they're stalling and they're, and they're hanging on to you, then you got to get your lower body involved and stand up and even give them a chance to um, hit you with an arm bar or triangle. And by the way, that's another you know as a last resort, giving someone something they can't they can't um, you know, resist, I'll tell you that I, I have a philosophy. There's three ways to get what you want in grappling and potentially in the world. One way is to friggin' take it, okay? You're in a good position. You're strong. Just grab that arm and rip it off. Um, and that's, that's what everybody tries to do. That's a white belt move. But, you know, that there's times when that's appropriate. Uh, the second way to get what you want is to put someone in a position where they have to give it to you. So let's just say you're 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 that knee on the stomach and you want that arm bar. So you go ahead and start to really choke choke them effectively. They lift up their hands to defend against the choke, and boom, you've got the arm bar. It's not that they made a wrong move. They had they had to deal with what you were giving them, and you trapped them. But the third and most elegant way to get what you want is to get someone to want to give it to you. Basically, make someone think it's a good idea to give you what you want. They didn't have to, but you made them think it, and that would fall into the realm of, for example. The guy's stalling. He's ahead on two points. I can't get the posture. I can't break this. So I lay my right arm across his chest, basically saying, go for an arm bar, and try and do it in a way that it's not too obvious that I'm doing that, with the hope being he will take the bait, he'll uncross his legs, and I'll attack for the arm bar. And then I'm very confident in my ability to whip that arm back or my arm bar defense to escape. So I'm basically not forcing the person to, to, to stop stalling and not forcing him to unlock his legs, but I'm giving him... I'm communicating with his brain, and I'm taking control and saying, hey, buddy, why don't you go for this spectacular finish here? And that will be my chance to, to break free and move. And it's a chance that you're taking, but, you know, what's the alternative? The alternative is you lose anyway. Mm-hmm. So um, that, that would be my sort of quick two-second, two or two-minute advice on what to do when someone's stalling a close guard. Now, if someone is in your close guard or in your guard and is stalling, so which usually means they're hunkered down, they're not trying to get up, uh, they've got their elbows maybe pulled back tight to their knees, and they're kind of controlling your lower body. And by the way, in both of these scenarios, I'll go back to my having a corner coach, letting the, letting the referee know loud and clear, because it's, it's the same situation as you described before where they were running from the fight, stalling is a form of running from the fight, uh, and you definitely want to have somebody, although it shouldn't be you, the fighter, you should be busy working on your, you know, concentrating on the fight, but somebody should be respectfully saying, he's stalling, he's stalling, he's stalling, to try to get the referee to put a little pressure on the fighter to move. Um, but in, in that case, if the person's hunkered down, uh, what I would do is I would start to use my hands to press against the side of their head to sort of tweak their neck and get them in an uncomfortable position and gyrate my body, you know, explode my hips up and down, up and down like a jackhammer to try to break free, create a little space. My goal being to unlock my feet and, if possible, get a foot on the hip so I could start to make some space and move away from this person. Um, and um, an, another great way, you know, and by the way, you can do that by just unlocking your legs. And if you unlock your legs in the closed guard and you just lay your feet on the ground and the person is still hunkered down, that really does start to make it obvious that they are not trying to pass your guard. They're not taking advantage, and that's a great way to get the referee on your side. Um, and, uh, again, I would bring that – I would put that falling into that category of you're going to take a little chance here. You're simply going to unlock your legs and, and lay your leg down on the ground and give the person this golden opportunity to try to start passing your guard as a means of getting the person to start moving so you can start moving and hopefully work your sweep. Um, but if they're not taking that bait, you've got to, again, just shake your body free. And keep in mind, you know, what I said earlier, that if you lose, you, you better be drag, you know, dragged off the mat. You should leave... All your energy on the mat, you should not be walking away with any energy. So this is the perfect time. You know, you're laying down on your back. He's stalling. It's time to absolutely go ballistic because you're going to lose the match. And if you do, you don't need that extra energy. So putting your feet on the ground, jumping your hips up and down, up and down, up and down to break space, pushing on the side of his head to put him in an uncomfortable position, trying to move your hips away, get your foot on his hip, and then go ahead and try to start to stand up or start to drag him into your attacks. And... Um, and you're off.
Okay. Well, that's uh, that's great advice. So uh, we're going to close the interview now, but I just want to tell the listeners that if they want more of your advice, they should. Uh, you've got lots of resources out there. You've got videos. You've got uh, a DVD series. You've got packages. And, of course, you've got the Training for Competition book. Uh, that's on Amazon, isn't it? And, and, and other places too. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's from Black Belt Communications, um, and uh, you can get it on Amazon. And uh, can I uh, say our website of for other material? Of course. Uh, B- BJJAmerica.com is, is where uh, my partner, John Will, and I uh, have materials that are largely designed for martial arts instructors. They're on the higher end in their curriculum materials, but individual fighters find them very useful too, um, and that might be something that your listeners want to check out. So BJJ America for more information. Awesome. Well, thanks yep. so much, David, and uh, good luck in your training and competition. Great. Great. Thanks, and same to you. You're awesome. Podcast listeners, I've got a big favor to ask for you. It's easy, but it's a big favor. If you are already subscribed, can you take the time to write a quick review, or even faster, just give the podcast a rating wherever you get your podcast. If it's in iTunes, it's really, really easy to leave a star rating, hint, five stars, or leave a comment just saying what you think about the podcast. That kind of feedback, that kind of signal is really, really useful to help the podcast grow. I appreciate it an insane amount and would love it if you would help me out by doing that. Thank you so much. Wow.